Good evening, everyone, and good morning to those in America. Um, it's a pleasure to be giving a presentation again on behalf of the, the Royal Institute of Navigation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, neural networks mainly and some of the challenges uh, with using neural networks in navigation systems and the aspect of, of how trustable uh, uh, neural networks are. So um, I'll touch quickly first on um, what neural networks are and the concept of data-driven programming. Um, but don't worry, that won't be too deep a dive. That will just be to introduce some concepts. Um, and then I'll give some examples of um, using neural networks for navigation and positioning purposes. Get onto some of the challenges that then emerge from trying to do that. And then we'll conclude with um, where, where I think uh, the right place is to try to use neural net networks in navigation systems and autonomous vehicles and things like that uh, are in order to actually be able to still have a trustable system at the end. Uh, so I think it's quite a uh, hot topic to be uh, having this conversation at the moment. Um, deep learning is very popular and is becoming more popular in our field in particular. So the ION GNSS conference was just last week and there were a number of uh, deep learning focused talks in there. And I expect we'll see um, an ever growing number of deep learning focused talks in the Royal Institute of Navigation conferences in the future as well. And so some highlights I picked out from last week, it's all signal processing purposes really. People were using neural nets to uh, detect spoofing um, in order to do the, the signal correlation itself of GNSS and to try to mitigate multipath. Um, and uh, we'll discuss in this talk about how um, how useful neural nets are for that signal processing side of things. But famously, people are using neural nets at the moment for much broader purposes than just signal processing. And indeed, there are some autonomous vehicle entities at the moment that are connecting up a neural network between the sensors and the control outputs and having a neural network control the entire car. And as we'll see during the course of today, um, I would not recommend that. Um, so let's uh, look at just a bit of terminology. Artificial intelligence is this very broad description of the entire field of um, developing automatic systems that have human-like behaviors in their reasoning and learning. And of course, there's the famous Turing test, which is that if you can create um, an artificial intelligence system that is so believable that if you communicated with it uh, purely via text conversation, and it was completely uh, indistinguishable from a human, then that computer passes the Turing test. And many people think we're close to that level of artificial intelligence. Within the field of artificial intelligence is machine learning. So these are the algorithms that build that level of overall human-like behavior. So each branch of machine learning is some tool that can be used to um, extract information typically from data. So um, simplest examples are um, algorithms that can extract parameters from data. So um, fitting curves through data, for example, to give you a model for the underlying behavior of your data is a classic example of machine learning. So it provides for you the parameters that produce a curve that fits the data, for example. And then deep learning is this subset uh, deep is referring to how many layers are in the neural network. And a neural network is basically an artificial brain. So that's the structure um, uh, that we're using to, uh, to, to uh, process the data with. Um, and deep learning mechanisms are trained on vast amounts of data. Um, so many machine learning tools are, are built traditionally by hand in a normal programming language. But the specific features of deep learning is that you train a neural network using huge amounts of data. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So I'll give a little intro as to how neural nets are trained to help you to understand where the challenges and the trustability comes from. So let's pick one of the most important problems facing society today, which is identifying cat pictures on the internet, which is uh, one of the gold standard typical applications of, of neural nets, um, image recognition. And so when I flash this image up, most of you instantly recognize the cat. And that's because of features in this picture that your brain instantly recognized. And it'll be the shape of the ears, the shape of the eyes, the overall body shape, the color, things like that. Um, and so what that means is your brain through your eyeball. So all of these pixels, which we can represent in a computer as intensities of different colors, pixel by pixel. And um, 
An artificial neural network therefore processes all of these numbers in order to try to classify this image. And a neural network would classify how confident it is in seeing these different uh, possible things in the image. So let's quickly look into how that works because it'll be useful for you to understand the difference between traditional programming and how a neural network works to understand how trustable they are. So this is a, a picture of a very, very simple, believe it or not, neural network. Um, so this input layer is referring to all of those pixels in the image. So there'd be as many dots down here as there are pixels in the image you're interested in classifying. And then each neuron um, simply takes all of the inputs. Um, so those numbers I showed you a moment ago that represent the intensity of each pixel in the image. And in a neural network, you can apply your own weighting to each of these connections. So each of these neurons here is connected to the previous layer with a weighting being applied each time to each of the pixels. Then the neuron itself has what's called an activation function. And what this means is depending on the total score, when we add up all of these numbers that are coming in with their weightings, it um, decides how much is then output. So the neuron kind of acts a bit like a filter as to how much we're going to pass out based on how much came in. And so one of the things you can tune in a neural network is this activation function as well. Um, and then you build up lots of layers. There's only one hidden layer in this example, but the deep part of a deep neural network, it depends on how deep these layers are, how many layers there are. And then your output layer is, is the answer that the neural network spits out. So each of these circles represents a possible classification like a, a cat, a dog, or so on, if you're using your neural network to classify an image. So I can give you a, a more explicit example. Let's say that we were going to um, uh, simply use very, very simple four by, uh, two by two uh, pictures. And the only things we cared about were an all white square, an all black square, or a horizontal black line or a vertical black line. So if we take the four pixels in the white image and apply them to the four input um, parts of the neural network, then in order to declare a white square as the output, then what we want to do is choose these weightings so that when we take the input value, multiply it by the weighting, and then add it to all of the others, we get a very high number. And so I've declared that to activate an output, we want this number to be above three. So knowing that I want this top box to read white square and that the white pixels are all value one, so all four white pixels are value one, that's how I'm declaring the color white in my scheme, then I can construct the weights in the neural network so that um, this adds up to four. And I'm going to then label that path as white square. So those weightings all mean that if I apply all ones in the front, I get four in that box and activate the white square answer. Now for the black square, I'm declaring black to be minus one instead of plus one. So white was plus one, black was minus one. So these are now four black pixels my four black pixels going to minus one, minus one, minus one. So in order to get the maximum activation in the next layer, I choose these weightings so that it's now uh, minus one multiplied by this, plus minus one multiplied by this, plus minus one multiplied by this. That gets me four again. That means I'll activate an output and I can now label this one as black square. You can follow the same process. So I'll manually assign these weightings this time it's a particular pattern of minus ones and plus ones, so that when my black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white pixels come into my neural network, this pathway and these weightings give me a high number again above the activation, and I'll label that one black horizontal stripe. So I've manually tuned, and I can do the same for black vertical stripe, I basically manually tuned this neural network. And if I keep the black vertical stripe in here, but apply all of the weightings for that neuron, that neuron, and so on. Uh, these are the neurons all get a score of zero when I put a black vertical stripe in, and this bottom one is the only one with a high score. And so I've manually built this neural network, basically, and I've manually picked these, these tuning parameters, and this is a very good neural network. It, it, will, it will confidently correctly label these very, very simple examples. And of course, for something much more complicated than a two by two image, 
then the weightings are much more complicated. The networks are much more complicated. Um, you've got a lot more pixels coming in and you can't simply sit down and tune the network just like I did there. It, in, it probably took me 10 minutes to, to manually tune that other network. In fact, in real life, um, you uh, have to go through a very complicated process and there are lots of algorithms and methods to choose all of these weightings and do all of this tuning. And fundamentally, it's based on having huge numbers of data and trying huge numbers of different images to tune all of this network so that it is a good, confident network that gives you all of these different classifications. And, and you have to manually label all of the images and then go through a process of tuning in order to get the, the neural network to work. And this is where we uh, come across the, the first kind of big difference I want to um, point out between traditional programming and the new methods using deep learning. So um, I just showed you how I basically programmed a brain to identify different sorts of simple images. And it was all by choosing numbers that were multiplied and added together in a certain way. Now, normal programming, traditional programming is not like that at all. Um, you use a programming language and you write in, um, in that language, in English, uh, effectively, uh, the structure and the rules of the program. So this, for example, is a simple uh, bit of code that I actually just took from the internet. I didn't write this. Um, I, this has nothing to do with me, but I fully understand what this program is doing. And other people who know how to write code would be able to as well. This basically is a little function that takes an input sentence. It looks through that sentence for keywords. If the keywords are there, it answers in a particular way. So it's saying a hello message with the right sort of Mr. Mrs. Miss. And if it sees queen as an input, then it actually says, good day, your majesty for any of the royals that are watching this talk. Um, and so it's very easy for another programmer to look at traditional programming and understand it, fix it, change it, uh, adapt it, and so on. And if there's any problems with it, uh, it's very easy to dive into where the problem is and to fix it. This picture here, as we just showed in the previous example, uh, this is actually a screenshot from the matrix, but the movie kind of got the concept of a neural network correct, because it's just a massive collection of numbers. That's all the neural network is, as I just showed you. And so a neural network version of this is just a huge collection of numbers. And so if, if um, there was a problem with this function, if it was outputting an incorrect sentence, if it was doing something confusing, you could jump into traditional code and see where that problem was and fix it. But you can't just decide that you're going to dip into um, a neural network full of tens of thousands or maybe millions of numbers and tweak one or two of them to fix the particular problem that it's saying, hello, mister, when it should be saying, hello, miss, or whatever. You have to retune the neural network. You have to start again. You have to go back to all of the data you've used to tune it and try to figure out what was wrong about the data labeling in order to have driven all of the numbers in the neural network. So it's uh, an entire paradigm shift in how we do programming when we move over to deep learning. Traditional programming, we set the rules like this in text um, based on how we want the system to behave and how we think the world should work. And then our rules that we've written and the data that our sensors provide us with are combined in the traditional programming uh, in, in code and the outputs fall out the other side. But with machine learning, you actually provide lots of pre-prepared answers and lots of data, such as here's a whole ton of different pictures of cats of all different types from all different angles and, uh, and things like that. Um, and by providing all of these labeled answers with all of the data, you pump through this training process, learning all of the weights in a neural network, for example. And what falls out is the set of rules that the machine learning tool can apply itself. But those rules don't exist anymore in a form that we can play with them and change them. They exist in an intractable form that we can't just tweak. So let me give you some examples of, of using neural networks for kind of navigation and uh, positioning purposes. This is a, an example of using a neural network within a pedestrian dead reckoning scheme. So what you're going to see is a smartphone that's running a neural network that when someone walks carrying the phone, 
um, what's displayed on the screen is a green arrow showing the heading through space and a little yellow speed bar showing the speed. And so it's solving the traditional uh, pedestrian dead reckoning problem of if someone is walking with this device, can I plot their path through space by determining when they're walking and which direction they're walking in and so on. Oops. And um, what you'll see is this little movie. If it doesn't come across very well um, on the presentation, you can go and find it on Focal Point's website. But you've got a green arrow that's showing you the direction of motion, regardless of how you're holding the phone. And we cover the camera there just to prove we're not using the camera. But this bit here is a really good example of why neural nets are so powerful. That's sideways walking being correctly detected and backwards walking being correctly detected, correctly labeled. It's really hard, if not impossible, to use traditional handcrafted code to determine the difference between sideways and backwards walking versus forwards walking. But actually neural networks can learn that sort of pattern really well, better than you can handcraft in code. And so it's a really good application of where we can use deep learning to solve a particular part of the navigation problem that we can't easily solve in handcrafting code. And, and that kind of feature recognition, recognizing complicated patterns and a lot of data is exactly what neural nets are really good at and where they excel. I'll give you another example, which is, uh, this is now an example of, of what I described earlier where you can bolt a, a neural network as the entire control and navigation system of a vehicle. You can connect up the sensor inputs at one end and you can pop out the control outputs, the throttle, the brake, the steering at the other end, and you can try and train a car to learn how to drive around. And, um, oops, sorry, it skipped on. So um, what you're gonna see is uh, this car here basically has a completely blank neural network uh, inside it. So it has completely random weightings being selected. So the inputs coming into the neural network are um, information like how far away it is from its target parking bay and the uh, sensor inputs from these green lines that represent collision avoidance systems. So these are little range sensors that are telling the car how close another object is to it. So the neural network is being passed these pieces of information about whether there's another object nearby and it's got a goal that it's trying to it's trying to park in this space um, and at the moment in the early stages of training um, because the weightings in the neural network are effectively just random start guesses um, the neural network is is just behaving quite randomly it doesn't yet know how to drive how to steer and so on but in this version of training the neural network, lots of brains initially are, are randomly being chosen. And when it accidentally does good behavior, that's rewarded. And those particular weightings and tunings in the, in the neural network are, are being kept. And um, when a, a version of the brain is done, do, you know, uh, fails miserably straight away, those weightings are all discarded. And you can go through this long laborious, you can see how many versions are clocking up over here of different brains that are being trialed um, to effectively try to learn how to behave and how to park this car. And if I skip on to the very end, there's been over 300,000 training attempts to start to try to try all of these different possible weightings in the brain until we start to um, tune this neural network towards a brain that is good at taking in the input data and uh, s correctly processing it into sensible steering, throttle, and brake settings. And if it took one minute on each attempt in the real world, this is over two thirds of a year of, of you know, trying to train this car in a car park. But of course, in simulation, you can train all of that uh, overnight on a laptop, or probably even faster than that. Now, the interesting thing is you take that perfectly tuned brain that's now very good at parking in the parking space. And you now put two cars in the car park with that brain. And because you've added another car and that wasn't in any of the training, these cars are now both fighting for the same parking space and they're crashing into each other. And this is called unwanted emergent behavior. We've trained a neural network really well on a load of input training data, but we then put it in a situation it's not familiar with. and 
this is unwanted emergent behavior. We don't want these cars to be hitting each other and trying to squeeze into the same parking bay. But the neural networks don't know how to deal with this situation. They've never seen it before. And um, this is the outcome, cars that are fighting over a parking space by hitting each other. Now, if this was a um, autonomous vehicle brain that was handcrafted in the traditional way with handwritten code, um, fixing this particular problem might be quite quick. It might only be a few lines of code to um, make it choose another parking space if there was a car in there uh, to also not crash into moving cars, just like it's learned not to crash into parked cars, etc. But with a neural network, we can't just dip in and tweak a few of those numbers to fix this problem. You have to retrain the neural network now with this new type of situation um, in the training data. Um, there's a whole branch of um, academic work on adversarial AI. How do we break each other's neural networks? Uh, how do we um, learn uh, what makes them fail before we put them in the world and their failure causes a big problem? And the interesting thing about it is it reveals that neural networks learn to completely different things than we learn about the same problem. So here, for example, are two pictures of a panda. You might think they're identical pictures of the panda. In actual fact, less than 1% of this very carefully crafted noise here has been added to this picture to make this new picture. So you and I can't even tell that this one is slightly noisier than this one. And we see exactly the same panda. But um, an image recognition system has scored this first picture as likely to be a panda with uh, about 60% confidence. But this one, it thinks with almost 100% confidence that it's a gibbon. And that's because the neural network has not has clearly not learned the features that we see, like two black eyes, a white pointy nose, a black ear, a white tummy, and the rest of this bear shaped creature is black. There's some underlying statistical properties in this image, which you and I probably can't even see. But those underlying statistical properties, perhaps the mean and the skew and the ketosis and the curvature of a certain property um, is different now between these two images. And it's that feature that the neural network thinks is different enough to declare that it's a different creature that it's looking at. In this example down here, we can still see that these are all stop signs. They've been fiddled with, but you know that they're stop signs. But in this example, from this particular research paper, um, the image classification scheme no longer classified any of these as stop signs anymore. It classified them as a different sign, like a turn right sign or a 50 mile an hour sign or a give way sign. And again, it's because the image classification scheme that was trained on a load of red stop signs did not learn red is a concept of danger in Western culture. The word stop in English, spelt S-T-O-P, means don't go past this point. It didn't learn any of that stuff. It's learned some statistical properties of these pictures, which you and I don't see. But when you pop these particular bits of sticky tape on the sign, it no longer sees a stop sign anymore or from its own data set, it doesn't believe that this is a stop sign. It believes it's something else. And so that's one of the biggest challenges. Neural nets learn different things to what we learn looking at the same data. And this is obviously a big problem. And so it's kicking off a new field um, called explainable AI, which DARPA have, have been pushing for in recent years. And Google last year announced a big push into explainable AI as well. And the idea is that instead of the current situation where the pixels just flow through the neural network and the light comes on at the other side, telling you that this is probably a cat or probably something else, and that's the only output you get from the neural network. With explainable AI, you try to build up knowledge of what's going on in all of the layers and understanding which layers in the neural network are identifying certain features or not. Um, and what you want is a, an AI that tells you that because it sees components in the image like fur, whiskers, claws, and particularly pointy ears, therefore it believes this is a cat because of that. And so um, this uh, is uh, where I'm hoping a lot of um, AI is going, that 
uh, we prioritize the explainable aspect first rather than rushing straight to to um, neural nets that just spit out answers that that seem to be the right sort of answer that we want. There's a few other aspects I think um, to note, especially around autonomous vehicles and my, my warning about sort of just throwing neural networks at the problem. Um, and this uh, is a, a nice little example of a, a two-year-old on a motorbike and a three-year-old in a go-kart um, that can successfully race. And those of you who are Formula One fans might know that Lewis Hamilton was um, winning go-kart races when he was about six, I think. And some kids start driving in go-karting competitions when they're just four. Um, and as you can see from this movie, these two children um, do a pretty good job of uh, staying between the white lines. And they know that red means stop and green means go and all of that kind of thing. But if you ordered an Uber this evening and a two-year-old turned up behind the wheel, um, you would not uh, want to get in and, and use that Uber. And the two-year-old might be perfectly capable of steering and, and using the accelerator and the brake and, and staying on the road and obeying traffic signs. But um, you would not trust the, the two-year-old to do a lot of the things that are nothing to do with driving that you think involve keeping you safe um, and be able to cope with complicated situations. In other words, we only give people driving tests at about 17 or 18 various countries because we believe they have a mental maturity at that age where they understand enough about the world to cope with any situation that's thrown their way. Um, the, we think they're mentally mature, but we have no definition of mental maturity for neural networks, for autonomous vehicles or guidance systems. It's just simply not a concept, but it, it needs to be one. And one of the challenges is around perception and, and how we bring 17 or 18 years of, of life knowledge of how the world works into the car when we get into it in order to pass our driving test. So here's an example where an autonomous vehicle would just drive past this because it thinks it's perfectly safe. A little toddler might drive straight towards it thinking that looks like great fun and it's very exciting and wants to go see what it is. And both a two-year-old and an autonomous car have no concept of fire, explosions, burning, petrol, danger, and so on. And just because the road looks clear to the Tesla doesn't mean it's safe to drive down it. Um, and so there's this perception problem of understanding what things mean in our environment, which um, is way beyond the current state of neural networks um, for, for uh, autonomous vehicles. And then you've got the next layer of this problem when you teach your autonomous vehicles to perceive things like fire and oil tankers, you want them to stop for the real ones, but you don't want them to stop for the advertising movie billboards that are advertising why petrol vehicles are dangerous and why you should buy electric vehicles and so on. And then you'd have that whole nother level of understanding the difference between a movie or something and something you really see in the world. And it just gets more and more complicated. And of course, we can label these things as corner cases. But in reality, if we're talking about trying to roll out AI into the navigation and command systems of, of vehicles all over the world and have billions of cars um, being driven by AI, then every day they will see multiple corner cases. Uh, and you just have to go and have a little poke on YouTube to see people surfing on cars and uh, Cessnas finding patches of motorway to land on. Um, and um, I think this one was in Russia, um, but understanding that if a tank is driving towards your patch of road, then you should come to a stop and give way and understanding what um, an ostrich is and that an image recognition system might classify that as a bush, but it's definitely an ostrich and uh, you wouldn't want to drive too close to it and you might be aware that it might be a dangerous thing to hit, even though it gives no radar return, etc. So there's all of these sorts of challenges uh, for perceiving the world and understanding what things are that are not on your driving test. So in, as I come around to a conclusion, um, how can we then decide which parts of a navigation system that we can entrust to a neural network and beyond the navigation system, the full autonomous platform perhaps in the future? And so I'd like to propose the equivalent of the Turing test for um, our navigation systems and our uh, autonomous platforms. So my version of the Turing test for answering this question is what I like to call the toddler test. So would I put a toddler in charge of this bit of my navigation system or my autonomous vehicle? 
So perhaps you'd be happy to put a toddler in charge of warning you that it can see a fire truck coming up behind you at great speed with the, the blue lights flashing. Maybe you'd be happy in your, in your car for your toddler to warn you of interesting things it's seeing that you might not be looking at, for example, and attract your attention towards them. You might not want to then move over and let your toddler handle the situation of the fire truck racing towards you at high speed from behind. Uh, and so I think there's a simple, a simple test. We can start to apply a simple rule um, to decide which parts of our system we can entrust to a neural network. And um, what this fundamentally means is that I, I think we should be using um, neural networks purely to filter our senses. So to provide um, outputs of sensors that we already use on our platform. So we might use a neural net to clean up information from our magnetic compass or to try to remove the multipath from um, a, a radio sensor um, uh, or to uh, provide some kind of situational awareness guidance, but that is still compared with other sensors in the system. And I don't think we're anywhere near using um, neural networks to replace the command and control structure that we use at the moment in things like autopilots, um, uh, where we have um, triple or quadruple redundancy voting schemes, and um, we actually uh, use probability and voting to decide if we're going to trust a sensor output to then execute a certain task. Um, I think we should stick to neural networks uh, cleaning up sensor data and not wire them up to any actionable outputs uh, and certainly not to the control mechanisms. Uh, we can, we al already have been able to build um, good uh, control uh, outputs for autonomous vehicles using traditional uh, programming languages and we should stick to them in my opinion. Uh, and I encourage you to have a play with um, learning uh, tools. They're quite cool and fun and it's, it's good to kind of see how they work. So um, there's a couple of links on here that are kind of easy to find. If you Google for genetic algorithms in the browser, you'll come across these nice little examples that just run in your browser and show you how machine learning works. So this one, for example, is, is this one here called genetic cars. And what this is, it's a genetic algorithm that's, that's trying to choose uh, the size of a number of wheels for a vehicle to uh, get across a certain terrain. And so it's, it's kind of randomly choosing at first parameters like how should I connect the wheels together, how big they should be, if there's any suspension, all this kind of stuff. And you can read up a little bit on how genetic algorithms work because I'm running out of time now for my talk. But this sort of stuff is a really nice example of genetic algorithms. And within a, maybe 10 minutes less probably in your browser, um, this thing will have, have trained itself up a nice little realistic um, motorbike in front of your very eyes that can traverse all of that terrain purely through um, a, uh, a machine learning process. And with that, I will leave it there and take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much.